Throning Team Liquid. And hey, I said earlier, Tribe got some great attitudes. Check it out. Jaymani walks off stage. He tweets, didn't have the best day, but I learned a lot of things that I need to work on. The rest of the Tribe boys played really well, so that's good. Ready for some individual play tomorrow. Clash Royale, the official Clash Royale count. Give him a little flexy muscle. Yeah. Add good attitude. And that's the way to look at it, right? It's Today is about feeling out the other teams, getting a, a kind of a check-in on what the other pros are playing and what you think you're going to need for tomorrow. But tomorrow, <laughs> that $20,000 open tournament is really where the big money is going to be made. It's been over three months since we've had a major competitive event, and that's one of the longest, uh, you know, drawn-out periods yes. since uh, the, the time between spring and fall season. So it's going to take a little bit of a reality check for these guys who are finally uh, getting a chance to flex their muscles uh, again. But uh, no damage for either player just yet. Azili's a little bit ahead in Elixir. He's going to pump up in the center. I like that a lot. And remember, Being, oh, do they remember that every player you've seen here on stage today has easily completed the 20 win challenge. And like in some cases, multiple. Like some of these players <laughs> have done the 20 win challenge on their own account, then on a mini account, on a free to play account, whatever, right? So right. these guys are the very best of the best. And sometimes it's hard to judge just like where you stand or how good you are at a given time because. You know, if, the, if all of them can 20 win, well then how do you really start to find that granular difference between these players? And it's events like this that allow us to sort that out. Zappy's come down, made short work up. Pekka comes down though. This Pekka Goblin Hut Zappy's deck is the most popular deck in the metagame, and I think it matches up pretty well against three Musketeers, although Azili's takes the early lead and has got to set up a second pump in a very short time. Great minion horde, but unfortunately uh, for Azili's, uh, just not enough to kill that flying machine down in uh, the one swipe that all six of those got. Zap coming in from Adrian Piedra. Keeps his right side relatively healthy. Guard's not going to get too much work done on the backside. But look out for Azili's. Already pumping up again and looking for that elixir advantage. No damage on either of his uh, towers. He's going to look to uh, continue pressuring that left lane if he can. But doesn't really have uh, much to say about that overall. With the 3 deck, he pretty much just has to split up his troops and uh, hope and pray that one of them manages to connect. A great poison from Adrian Piedra catches the Musketeers, the tower, and the pump in the left lane. Insane value. Like, that's a six elixir pump, that's six elixir worth of Musketeers, and you just took most of them out. Now, the Miner's going to come down to block, with the idea being that those Musketeers can still get some shots off. And they are, actually. Nothing's really hitting them. Wow, pretty good there. Good recovery by Azili. That could have been very, very bad for him. Ooh, doesn't manage to catch the Miner out back. That's going to be a couple of swings. Three, even, onto that Elixir Collector. Nice play by Adrian Piedra, just trying to whittle away at that tower. Right side's going to take several wow. swings. The World Ghost connects. That's three swings in total. Going to take it down to triple digits with the poison added on top. Adrian Piedra pulls ahead in damage overall. And actually, the Goblin Hut's working really well there because it stalled the Musketeers in place, giving a little bit of time for one to die. And they do get a spear throw off before getting shot, so it really helps out there. However, that tower down to 626. We have a good race here. We have 888 on Azili's right side, 626 on Adrian Page's left side. This is really going to come down to just a, a moment of great oh. play opportunity. Oh no, didn't want to hit the King Tower there. Yikes, a little bit of a sloppy play from Adrian Pager there. Activating the King Tower will mean that his miner's going to have a lot more difficulty Got connecting down, onto right? that right side. Oh, the Royal Ghost Invisible gets to deploy. The Dark Prince is going to connect, and the Miner too. Azili's does it four games in a row, and now he is a threat to become one of the highest elimination players in today's event. Wow. Yeah, I mean, like, he had he had one or two. Or, I, mean, I don't know how many he had earlier. He had, like, three, I think. But he just got this consistent pro team in Clash Royale. So they have a great roster. There's no Esports. Nova as well. You're right. I'll give a shout-out to Nova. Nova I, I and Queso have been around Queso, the longest. Yeah, yeah for right, sure. Right. Yeah. Of the teams that are here today. And uh, Tribe also been around a while, but I think a little after Queso and... Right, the, yeah, yeah. They, they, I think they came in uh, maybe six, eight months after Queso. Yeah. So Zillies, is, we'll see what they're running. Both running Ice Golem. Not a lot of Knights we've seen today. We've seen some Knights. Not any Valkyries, though, but really Ice Golem seems to be the mini tank of choice for players in this tournament. Setting up a Gobble Hunt out back. Gets Fireball down to Ego Beast starting off slow here, just swiping down this little ground-based push. Moving on in from Azili's, hoping to get some value out of this Mega Minion. But uh, Spear Goblin's really stacking up. Nice zap there, I guess Diego Beast thinking that he can get a little bit of a chip off onto the Goblin Hut there and deal with some of those uh, green guys that were stacking up there. Ooh, right good. side push is looking deadly though, RM him. I don't know, that's a pretty good Electro Wizard that's going to do a lot to stop there. The guards come in to try to pick off the Not Electro Wizard and Tower enough. connects. This is called Balloon Cycle, where it's a very fast, cheap deck with the idea being you're going to play multiple balloons. Azili's, on the other hand, playing a much more uh, build-up, defensive-style graveyard deck. Both players have taken a tower early here, and now it looks like we're going to be having a 2-1 or 3-crown game. 
So the Zillies had plenty of elixir there. He chose to, instead of defend the right side, to go aggressive on the left, dropped a graveyard to get to that 1-1. One, one. Uh, that could have been a strategic decision, just thinking that he might be better positioned to go for the 2-1, or even to go for the 3 crown at this point. He's got the king down to 2173. Uh, or it might have just been a spur of the moment. This yeah. is what I got to do to you know leverage uh, the elixir I've already spent on that left lane. I think it might be more spur of the moment, only because looking at the decks, I feel like Diego B's cycle balloon deck would be able to take that second tower easier than a graveyard deck would be able to. There's no big tank in Azilis' deck. There's not like, unless I have eight cards, something I'm not aware of. It's not like there's no giant. So it's not like you can cast graveyard and then play the giant and have both towers attacking the giant and let your graveyard go crazy. Uh, in general, graveyard decks are not good at doing 2-1 victories, but balloon decks are all right at it. So you do it. Yeah, graveyard doesn't like to go for the 2-1, of course, because the king tower being activated makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah two uh, towers skeletons shooting go, skeletons. Yeah, you need so, a really big tank out front. So guards will come down here and try to draw a little bit of fire, but I, I don't think the graveyards are going to be that effective from here on out. But that doesn't exactly mean that doesn't mean that Diego B is going to win or by any means, right? <laughs> They're getting some damage in there for sure. Certainly not. Diego B is drawing fire, though. A fire ball onto that center goblin hut and chipping the left side of the tower. Just about evenly uh, paced out here. A nice little defensive setup for Azilis over on the left side. Reaches 10 elixir and he will play another goblin hut in the center. Trying to keep the pressure up onto that king tower, but plenty of uh, spread out damage coming in from this hunter. Trying to finish off this ice on first. He might get a chance to shoot at some of these uh, guards or goblins moving in, but nope, they stab him down first. And that's a pretty big counterattack from both players. Graveyard coming into the king tower up top, and it's a balloon floating in the left lane. Well played from Azilis on bottom. But Still that's, falls short. Yeah, that's a huge hit from Azilis. He's given the well played, but it looks like he's going to be uh, the one who played this better. Poison uh, up on the king, and Diego V didn't have much longer to live. One more cycle. Yeah, only one more poison. So he played one card, two cards, make three, I think, now, four, and now poison should be in hand. And all he has to do is poison the tower for the victory. And there it goes. And that means Azilis is going to continue its win streak five matches in a row, five games in a row. Who is this? As uh, they watch their teammates try to hang on to the hill. And this is another great NA versus EU matchup. McHugh, the best player from New Jersey, and I'd say maybe the best player from the whole East Coast, is going up against Azilis, the most, I would say, maybe the best French player right now for many years, or for many months and years, I guess <laughs> it would be Nem Sensei, who was sort of the original Clash Royale pro. He was a French player. But in the last couple years, or really last couple months since King's Cup 2, Azilis has really shown his dominance, and now I think we might be seeing a whole lot more of him. Oh, the bandit dashes and holds the Dark Prince in place, allowing Magic Archer to take a few more shots and survive. Really great exchange there for C. McHugh. On defense, he's going to get a lot of value with that band, and then going back on attack, getting a little bit of damage off of that Prince. And a minor chips that left side tower down quite a bit, and that's exactly what C. McHugh is looking for there. He looks like, uh, to, like he's running a, a log bait style deck here with uh, two different goblin cards, goblin gang and the spear goblins, uh, but plenty of light chippy damage from CMQ. No heavy hitters uh, we've seen in the deck yet, as opposed to Azilis, who is running a very heavy deck. But what is that from CMQ? The six elixir giant skeleton, heavy stopping power. Uh, but I don't know if it's going to be able to find anything to, to hit. First appearance yeah. in today's event. Now, this is an interesting card because what I really like is that Magic Archer is pretty good against these giant decks. You can put Magic Archer right at the bridge, and it'll shoot through the giant, hit the tower for some good chip damage. Ooh. Weird placement there. I think the idea is that you're going to get the minions uh, on the counter attack. Yeah, I guess but. so. Chipping them down, and uh, we'll get a little bit of chip off onto that giant skeleton, but felt a little awkward. Looks like it uh, managed to get the job done anyways. Interesting here, though, is that Giant Scout's going to hold the, te the tower's attention for a pretty long time, allowing Miner to get some serious damage there. Will it be enough to kill this? Go! It does blow up on the Prince! It takes a little while for the Prince to actually start the charge, and during that time, he's moving kind of slow. Giant Skeleton Bomb blew up on him and at least helped uh, mitigate the counterattack. Right. Little Horsey just needs to gallop and uh, pick up speed. Couldn't quite make it away from that Giant Skeleton Giant Bomb. CMQ reaches 10 Elixir right after Azilius. Azilius with a big old Giant out back is going to be facing another Giant on the left side. This one, a Skeleton though, carrying that big old bomb. Uh, giant Skeleton's a really interesting card because he's such a good defensive. If you remember, there was a time early in the game where he was like the best tank in the game, and it was an interesting meta because it's really hard to attack into a Giant Skeleton. He can blow up on everything. Giant Skeleton is actually maybe making a comeback as a card that's good against the Golem decks that you're going to see where everything's all bunched up. You put the Giant Skeleton in the middle, the Giant Skeleton dies, and then blows up on everything, including the Golem and the Night Witch behind it. Exactly. And if you do manage to get lucky enough to get that guy onto tower, he deals a ton of damage one of uh, the more difficult win conditions in the game, but if you manage to uh, get enough of a beatdown attack against your opponent, you can definitely get value out of that. Now, the dangerous thing for this bomb is that if it is a little bit too far away, ooh, oh. wouldn't have hit, but still, 
big blast radius manages to clip both of those princes on the charge. I think it really takes advantage of how slow the princes are immediately after hitting something. Like they right. go really fast when they're charging, but if you can stop them with a giant skeleton, then that bomb looks like it's going to go off pretty consistently before the princes can get out of the way. If you were to just show me these spear goblins, bandit, you know, really chippy light based defense, even the magic archer, I would have been uh, quite surprised that CMQ would have been uh, able to hold off this long against such a heavy beatdown deck from Mazzilli's, but really clever defense and getting lots of great value uh, out of relatively small troops. Like, look, Spear Goblin is back on the counterattack again. Get an opportunity to strike in there. Looks like he got stopped short right at the bridge, but Azilius has had to drop eight Elixir to deal with a relatively small push from CMQ. Yeah, that was, I think, a turning point there for McHugh. He's actually got a little bit of an elixir lead right now on the board. The problem I see with McHugh is that he got damage in early, got a lot of damage in early, took a big damage lead, but since then, it's been Azilis the one who's been slowly chipping away every push. I haven't seen McHugh generate a lot of damage since, uh, other, since that initial miner that was attacking the tower while the giant skeleton was... Uh, holding the attention. A double giant push. It is absolutely massive right now. Coming in hard on that right lane. The minion horde on defense stays out of the poison just long enough. This giant's going to get a few punches off, though. Right side going down below that 2k mark, but looks like it won't be too much worse for wear. The defense is going to hold up after all with the, uh, the spear goblins in back uh, chipping it down. CMQ has managed to keep his attention on that left side tower and now down to triple digits. He's gotten a nice lead over there. And once again, Miner is really doing the work. It doesn't do a ton of damage, only 64 damage on every tower swing. But if the tower's not shooting it, then he just sits around and think, think, think. It's not magic, it's a shovel, but it will <laughs> take that tower down eventually. Magic Archer getting those shots off. You really want to leverage that long projectile range uh, that the Magic Archer has. The ability to pierce through plenty of targets is a really great opportunity uh, to get a lot of splash damage in there. Miner does go down to a pretty lucky Prince Charge right out back of the tower. Best barely got that off, but Good catch there for C. McHugh uh, on the defense side. Looks like he's got a Goblin Gang to deal with this giant clean 3 for 5 trade, and he gets a Magic Archer to split into the opposite lane now. Magic Archer, one of the few cards in the game that can do that. It's got a long enough range where it can sit in the left lane and shoot across to the right lane uh -oh. and then still go down the initial lane. getting awfully close over there. Uh -oh. Trying to get pulled back by an Ice Spear. And I don't the know Prince is do He's there! He's there! Now, at this point, McHugh just has to stay alive because as soon as that giant skeleton dies, the game is over. So McHugh playing a little bit of defense here. Magic Archer is going to shoot through and the bomb blows up. McHugh defeats Azili's of Team Liquid. Meant that he entered ESW set versus Team Liquid and Tintu. Let's see if he's their answer to start uh, the ball rolling for Tribe Gaming. We'll see if uh, Razor was just the kryptonite for Tribe Gaming or if they're just having a little bit more difficulty uh, overall. Nice hit from the Royal Ghost onto that Sparky before he gets taken down. Azili's reaching 10 Elixir now will defend with a Goblin Hut. Not going to be able to finish off this uh, Sparky. A giant to block! And that is an amazing play from Tin 2. That Sparky going to stay nice and healthy out back. Will obliterate the little mini Sparky. Zappies have been taken out. Bats swooping on in to provide a little bit of air support for this push. And Tin 2 has got a great chance to strike the left lane. Boom goes the dynamite. Left side takes a massive strike. Second hit from the Sparky wallops the tower, and Tin 2 has already gotten one down in the first 50 seconds of this game. And this is the second time that we're seeing Tin 2 use a Sparky. He played a Sparky versus an Expo deck his first matchup. This time it's a little bit more favorable. He took down a tower within the first minute and like 10 seconds of the game. That's what Sparky does best, though. If you don't have an answer for it, or if you make one little mistake, Sparky will take your tower instantly, as we just saw. And Chad, is Sparky, like, low-key actually a decent, like, meta card that people will play now? I mean, uh, I'm going to say yes. I mean, we've seen, I would say, uh, just off the top of my head, at least 20% 20, 20 of the games had Sparky in them. So if pro players are going to use it at a 20% usage rate, you have to say, in essence, it's a meta card. Asuchini, the Sparky Master, is followed up now by Tin2. Getting plenty of shots on tower. The Sparky's Oh my goodness. Up. Oh no. Boom! There it goes again. Tin two with two towers. Oh man. Tin two, two towers. A Zillies. He just he doesn't know what to do right now. Ah, oh, the, the best part is when Sparky takes your tower, it's the most gratifying you know experience. It's like one of those, like, yes! And then if you're the person who loses your tower, it's you know, you want to you sit in the corner and cry a little bit. <laughs> no time for that, though. So Astelis has got another minute to try to hang on it's for not dear over yet. life. It's not over yet. Pekka and Flying Machine are going to be able to take down this giant pretty quickly. But 
Oh, wow. Sparky just does so much work. So much work. Fireball takes out the Zappies, and Tintu's going for the triple. Extremely nuanced play from Tintu. You saw that. He knew that even though Azili's had that zap to reset the Sparky, he's got both bats, spear goblins, and the goblin gang to punish the lack of zap at his opponent's hand. We have seen a lot of log bait and fireball bait decks. This is truly a zap bait deck, specifically zap. And there's no way Boom, to shut it down. Shaka,